Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I think when I first started thinking about the problems of empty buildings was when I was about 19. Um, my friend Sean and I had this uh, genius plan, I think it came from a train trip and a lot of drinking, uh, that we were going to uh, get a, a building somewhere in Newcastle, we were all going to move in there and with our mates and we are going to do lots of cool stuff and um, I don't think we'd really defined what the cool stuff we were going to do was but we'd, we'd, we'd read some uh, stuff about you know, Andy Warhol and the factory in New York and um, we thought we'd do something similar in Newcastle, not realising that Newcastle and New York were quite different and Andy Warhol and us were quite different and we were 19 and we didn't really have a clue what we were doing. I started to think about it again a few years later when I was um, uh, working on a festival. Uh, this is not art festival here in Newcastle and, and uh, knowing that I knew a lot of people who wanted to do interesting things in empty buildings in Newcastle but for various reasons I couldn't uh, negotiate them getting access to those spaces. I thought about it again, I've lived in Melbourne now for about eight years, but um, I thought about it again a few years ago. I had an ingenious plan. I was going to come back to Newcastle and start a bar. Um, I had uh, spent the last uh, a few years kind of agitating around the idea that we needed to have you know, better liquor licensing laws, um, allowing for small-scale stuff. I was a really big fan of all the cool little laneway bars and venues in, in Melbourne, and I thought, when the liquor licensing laws changed in New South Wales a few years ago, I thought, I, 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 will, I will go back to Newcastle and I will start a bar. And that's when it really hit me that the uh, problem that I thought was uh, had previously been my own inexperience and inability to negotiate these things was actually something a bit bigger. Um, I contacted pretty much every real estate agent in Newcastle and I said, I've got this... I didn't actually say I've got this ingenious idea I want to start a bar, but I had some money and I thought, you know, I can afford to rent a place now and I can afford to pay a proper commercial lease and I don't have to get too bogged down in the complexities of this stuff. Um, what have you got? And... I didn't hear back from anyone. Like, turns out that there weren't any buildings in Newcastle that were suitable for the purpose that I was trying to rent them for and that no one was actually practically interested in renting them for me. So I came up to Newcastle, thought I'd better take some notes, I'd better see what's actually, um, what's actually here. And um, I was initially doing this stuff a little bit remotely via email from Melbourne. I thought I'd better go and take some notes and see what's around in terms of empty buildings. Uh, so I did. I went and uh, walked from... There we go from uh, one end of Hunter Street to the other, and I kind of took notes and photos of all of the buildings I could find that were empty. And there are a lot of them. Um, there was... All of these photos were taken around the time uh, in about 2008, when I was uh, wandering around and looking at uh, starting up Renew Newcastle. This is roughly a kind of east to west, uh, west to east tour of the city at the time. It was uh, pretty confronting, I think. I, I think when you live here, maybe you don't notice quite so dramatically the changes that are taking place. Going away and coming back, it's like you sort of see it in time lapse. It's like everything suddenly goes from being totally broken to uh, everything suddenly goes from being, you know, wow, there was that shop, that shop was, uh, that street was busy last time I was here, it's gone. Um, I think when you're here, it's like that shop closed down, or in my case, it's like that empty block has entirely disappeared. So I took notes, and then I mapped them. I kind of uh, drew this... Uh, actually, well, I wrote them in a little notebook, but then I went and uh, uh, basically took... Uh, plotted them all on a map, all the places that I'd actually been to and seen, and uh, looking and tried to count them all. And there was about 150 empty buildings in the um, two main streets of Newcastle in 2008. Now, lots of people have thought about this problem down the years. There's been no lack of um, uh, ingenious schemes, terrible schemes, brilliant ideas that never happened, people that have thought about this problem. But one of the things I keep coming back to is the idea that if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, my... Uh, most people have tended to look at the problem of the city of Newcastle as a hardware problem, a problem with, what, with what's there, what's built, 
But I, I had a different idea, which is that maybe it's a software problem. Maybe the problem is not that the buildings themselves are unusable and no one wants to use them. Maybe the problem is that other people are encountering the same problems that I was encountering when I was trying to access these spaces. The spaces were empty. They were sitting there and they were suitable for certain purposes, but the people who wanted to use them for those purposes couldn't actually make them work. Um, there's been lots of reports down the years, lots of fantastic studies, some of which I think have been um, good, some of which have been less good all of which have um, assumed that the problem is a hardware problem. This is one of my favourite examples. This is, a, um, this is artist illustration from a report uh, done on the revitalisation of Newcastle. Um, as though the, what needs to happen is these new buildings need to be built and this street will be like this and these cars will be here and uh, the city will transform when this new plan is rolled out. This is an artist illustration from another master plan done of the exact same street with almost the same two cars, but this was done five years apart. Now, I'm not saying that the problem with the city is that... I'm not saying that the city doesn't need to have good master planning and doesn't need to think about the long term, who's going to build what where stuff, but sometimes I fear that uh, the process of um, doing all these master plans makes people forget that actually... This, this street was kind of mostly empty in between those five years. And that the problem of thinking about it and deferring it to, to the, the long-term future often lets you forget about what can and should happen today, tomorrow, the next day, and the day after. And scarily enough, as I noticed on my little tour, even when you build new buildings, they don't necessarily have any people in them. Um, I didn't actually... I've got lots of photos. Um, there, it was no more likely that a new building was active and full than an old one was in, in my travels. Building things didn't seem to actually solve the problem. Um, so, I go back to this question. What if this is a software problem? What if it's a problem with the rules? What if it's a problem with the processes? What if it's a problem with um, the reasons why people can't do things? Um, and what if the problem for the city is a blockage of passion and energy and enthusiasm and not simply about capital and investment? Um, I think that passion is the most transformative force in the world. I think momentum, initiative, enthusiasm are forces that are real and at work in the world. And if you can channel them, you can achieve amazing things with very little resources. I couldn't afford a hammer. So I couldn't, didn't have the opportunity to treat this as a hardware problem. Um, I was obsessed with it, but I couldn't afford to build anything. I couldn't afford to buy anything. Um, I couldn't afford to own anything. In the end, the seed funding for Renew Newcastle came from my credit card. What we tried to do instead was set up the cheapest, simplest, most efficient mechanism we could set up to make the largest number of things that could possibly happen, happen. And we wanted to run an experiment. We wanted to see what would happen if we actually did this, if we actually lowered the barriers to entry and made it easy for lots of people to try lots of things. We were lucky in that uh, GPT were unlucky and had acquired uh, a, a big... Uh, a big uh, oops, got to run that again. Acquired a, uh, a site around the Hunter Street Mall where there was lots and lots and lots of empty buildings. Uh, this is the mall a couple of years ago. All of those red dots were empty buildings or empty tenancies when we began. And this is a peak lunchtime crowd in the Hunter Street Mall <laughs> at around that time. Um, now, you'll notice one of the reasons... Now, one of the reasons why all of these buildings... All of the... Uh, there's no one there is because there's nothing in a lot of the buildings. Now, I, as far as I know, this thought had not mostly occurred to people who were looking at what was happening. Um, you will see that various efforts had been made to activate the area. You can see there was this <laughs> nice use of um, bench and pole. Uh, the pavings were redone in this little block here. Uh, and the new... There's another pole. I didn't actually circle that. And the new, bench, and the new um, seating was put in. Um, again. Uh, bench, bench, nice little bit of thing around the tree there, a nice lamp. Um, now, lots of discussions have happened about what people should do with this sort of stuff. It's very expensive. It's not necessarily bad. I want to sound like I think this is not good. It's good, but it may miss the larger point, which is that for all of the empty spaces here, those shops are actually empty. And no one's going to go there while all those shops are actually empty. 
And no one's going to want to be the first one to open up on an empty block. So Renew Newcastle was created, and Renew Newcastle is software. We don't actually have much money. We don't actually build anything, buy anything, own anything. What we've tried to do is um, create a set of processes and structures that make it as easy as possible for people to do things. Our, so our software are our ideas, our contracts, our, uh, the agreements that we use to get people into spaces, the, the relationships that we broker, the way in which we um, start with what is easy and try and do as much of that as humanly possible, rather than waiting for 10 years to do what is, might be ideal. Um, we have a very simple idea, which is to make the city work for people with imagination and initiative and not just capital. All of the debates that I've seen, or most of the debates, are about how do you attract capital. Well, what if you don't have any? What if you're in the situation that I was in years ago where you want to make things happen and you don't have much money? Well, if you've got passion, if you've got enthusiasm, we want to channel that into being a transformative force for the city. So what we did was we managed to negotiate with the owners of all these empty shops to let us into them and allow us to broker access to them for people while they weren't being used. Um, here are some examples of people doing things in those shops. One thing I love about Renew Newcastle is that virtually every project that we have done is someone's passion. It's something that someone has been desiring to do for a long, long time, but the barriers to entry were too high. The cost or the complexity was too high. Um, we have, over the last three years, brokered access for more than 70 projects. We've currently got about 30 under management. There's about 40-something spaces in Newcastle that we have activated um, through brokering access to people into them to use them. Uh, I won't talk about them individually, but I think all of them are, in their own ways, amazing examples of what people can do. So, um, at a very practical level, what Renew Newcastle is doing is changing the city by doing all the small things, not waiting for the big things. This is a shop. That's what it looked like after it was fixed up. It had been empty for ages. Some people came in and did that with it. That has become that. That became that. And the bigger lesson from all of this is that passion brings people to the city. The transformative force isn't about money. It isn't, um, it's about passion. Over time, this is, this is where we started in the mall. All of these red dots were empty when we began. These little green things are our little Renew Newcastle projects that we started to plant in that space. These little yellow flags are new commercial tenants that moved back in as the people came back. Over time, the area transformed much more dramatically than all of the spending on hard infrastructure and master planning in years before had actually achieved. That's the, uh, that's the before, that's the after. The difference is staggering. And it's cheap. Some key principles that Renew Newcastle has followed and learnt along the way. Um, the first one is, is very simple. Lower the barriers to entry. If you, if you, if you, if you want to uh, make a city an interesting place, one of the key things is how easy is it for people with interesting ideas to do them? If you make it easy for people with interesting ideas to do them, you will get an interesting place. That's principle one, number one. Second idea is that you cannot decide what is going to work. I, you can give me all the money in the world and tell me to write a master plan tomorrow and, and make uh, my vision of what should happen happen, and I'm probably placing an all-in bet on something that may or may not fail. You cannot decide, you have to discover it. And the best way to discover it is by letting a lot of people try a lot of things. Renew Newcastle has done that 70 times over. Some of the projects have failed, some of them have succeeded, some of them succeeded by failing, People discovered that something didn't work and discovered something else that did work out of what they were doing. But in the end, that process of constant experimentation is an engine for diversity and interest and innovation in the city. Um, oops. Initiative, imagination and passion and not just capital are keys to revitalisation. The city is healthy, diverse and interesting when people can try things 
that they are passionate about and invest their passion in it. If you don't allow that, you end up with a city where people are building everything to an economic formula, where people are trying to take the least amount of risk to make the maximum amount of money. And out of that, you don't get genuine diversity and interest. And the last lesson that I learned is very simple, that our liabilities are our opportunities. I have been talking about the story of Renew Newcastle in different places around the country and working with other places. Um, I, I recently had a chance to do a talk uh, with some people in Sydney, in the city of Sydney, and they are quite... Uh, uh, what's the word? They are troubled by the fact that Sydney is struggling to get interesting, diverse, small-scale things happening in it. I'm told them this story and show them all these photos and whatever else. And um, they, were, they were sort of like, this is what we need to have more of in Sydney. But they said, look, we've got one problem. We're not lucky enough to be Newcastle. <laughs> we don't have the advantages that you had. We don't have the opportunities that you have. And I thought, if there's one single definition of success in this whole project, <laughs> it's when people talk about how lucky you are to have 150 empty buildings lining the two main streets. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>